All right, welcome. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. I hope you're all glad to be here. Happy to bring you this study. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pump to the jump to the first slide here because let's start at the top, right? It's it's my conviction that there's a wealth of truth that can be uncovered from a study of the Hebrew word olam. That's a phonetic spelling. If you use Blue Letter Bible, that's what you will find. I was asked in the hallway, do I speak Hebrew? Well, I'll have you all speaking Hebrew before the end of this, this presentation. Um, what I mean by that is you'll at least have a vocabulary of 10 or 12 or 13 words. Uh, it's amazing that how far that will go. Hebrew only has about 6,000 words. And like a lot of languages, if you learn a few hundred, you have 90% of it. Because like most languages, we use a lot of words commonly over and over and over again. And the Bible does that all the time. Be forewarned, this is probably one of the more complicated studies I've ever undertaken. So I'm going to project myself into the audience and say, and I suspect it will be complicated and complex for you as well. Hebrew is an oriental language. We're already biased, you and I, because we come from Western culture. We are used to Western languages Western language systems, like English or even Greek or Latin, for that matter, uh, are are much high. They're higher typed. That's the term. High typing means you can look at things and identify exactly what part of speech they are and how they're organized in the sentence. We have things like punctuation. All right, Hebrews didn't have that, but there are lots of good tools available to us, and I tried to put them to good use. And I bring you this study. I hope that. It, it touches something in you and, and causes you to ask lots of questions. This is not about answers. This is about getting on a journey. This is a journey. And that, that particular figure of speech will become clear to you as, as we progress. All right, imagine just for a moment, you're a Hebrew, you're an Israelite. And let's imagine for a moment that you are living in Palestine pre-Advent, okay? So we're, we're talking quite a long time ago, uh, let's say 2,000 years ago. Now for 1,600 years, Jehovah has committed to Israel the oracles, right? The oracles of God. What's an oracle? It's that which speaks. So in a manner, it's still the Hebrew disp dispensation because the Hebrews still have the Holy Scriptures, right? The, the New Covenant has not been written, right? You don't have any of the Greek New Testament, as we call it. But you're living under a Roman government, and as the prophets foretold, that's the time of the great empires, right? If you look at Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar was, was told to expect three kingdoms that will follow after you. So when we go to the synagogue and we, because we don't right, all have a library at home, go to the synagogue, we listen um, to the scriptures being read, the word olam, it flows from the sacred scroll, scrolls, it's repeated. One day we stumble across a peculiar passage in, in uh, Ecclesiastes. It's 311. Feel free to turn there. I've got it on the board. This is my resultant version. He has made things beautiful in their season. He has placed the olam in their heart such that mankind cannot trace out the work products that Jehovah has produced from head to tail, meaning from beginning to end. This passage generates a couple of interesting questions. What did the word olam mean? in the Hebrew language. Well, and how is it used in the scriptures, right? If I use the word cool, it's all contextual, right? If the room, if the air in the room is cool, I'm saying it's between, what, 60 degrees and 70 degrees or something. If I say, ah, oh, that's a very cool shirt you've got on. I mean, it's attractive, right? Totally different meaning. So we're going to uh, consider that. What do you have if you're a Hebrew? You've got the Torah, you have a couple other uh, collections, if you will. You've got the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and you've got the Ketuvim, which is a collection of the Psalms and other writings. It's the way the 
the Hebrew scriptures are organized. If you want the complete organization, a little hard to read, I'm gonna mail this presentation out to everybody who has an email. So um, use the props. If we don't have your email, Rusty will take it, okay? And I'll have it out to you this afternoon. So reality check, right? We don't have the papyri of the New Covenant. Those haven't been written yet. We don't have the benefit of Koine Greek. Why would that be a benefit? Well, it's a Western language. <laughs> it's much easier to read, right? It has very simple characters which get organized in two words and the characters can be, there's only 20, I believe 24 letters in the Greek language. The Hebrew characters look like essentially Sanskrit. They're very difficult, much more difficult to recognize. Koine Greek has very highly definitized, as I said, parts of speech. Nouns, pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, definitized verb tenses. Hebrew is much more difficult. I'm not gonna make it difficult for you. I'm gonna have you all, like I said, speaking 12 words of Hebrew before you, before you leave this uh, conference. You don't have the word eon in your vocabulary. It hasn't been invented yet. There are nine inflections of that word in the Textus Receptus. That, that should tell you something right there. Perhaps Ola has got nine inflections. Maybe it's got more, maybe it's got less. But you can't take advantage. You cannot take advantage of the law of divine interchange. We know what that is, right? That which is quoted in the New Testament from the Old allows us to do a comparison and say, okay, these words have an equivalence. Sheol, Hades have an equivalence. Basilea, Malkuth, right? Kingdom have, have a equivalence. We don't have that benefit. So we're going to work with just the Hebrew. This is the outline for the presentation. We mentioned the peculiar passage. Now we're going to talk about the problem of this word olam. What does it mean? Is there a definition for it? Well, what are the themes that run through the word? <clears throat> Why does it relate to this conference? Well, that's down at the bottom, right? The olam of the olam. This is a deductive study. I think to some degree, the other presentations that we've heard today, and they're very, uh, and yesterday as well, they're very good ones, but they're inductive. We have some knowledge of the kingdom of God. When you know what you're looking for, it's oftentimes easier to find it. You can find needles in haystacks if you know you're looking for needles, because then you can invent a magnet, right, and try to trace those things. This is more deductive. There are a number of interesting occurrences we'll explore. There are linguistic forms. I'm not gonna turn you all into, you know, um, I was gonna say English teachers, in this case, Hebrew teachers. Uh, but just to give you some tools, let you know what resources are available to you and, and call your attention some of these very interesting forms. They only appear in Hebrew. They're really, in some cases, there's no equivalent uh, in Greek. And they're difficult, right, to put into English. I apologize if the type is small. The punchline here, there's two punchlines, right? Olam is a masculine noun. Look at the translations in the King James. It's translated ever, everlasting, old, perpetual, evermore. You, you can read. Most of those are adverbs or adjectives, not nouns. Well, that's odd. So the three immediate questions, if our concordances indicate that olam is a masculine noun, what gives? Or in the Saturday Night Live uh, sequence of events, they call it, what's up with that? Why are there so many English words? Why so many multiple parts of speech? Why, why is that required to translate one Hebrew word? Can't we just translate olam forever, you know, and be done with it? Well, I think we'll find that's not the case. And here's a contrast, right? Just to give you a sense of, kind of underscore that point. Jonah, uh, chapter 1, 17 and, and uh, 2, 6. We know that Jel uh, Jonah was in the belly of the fish, and scripture says, forever, until he was brought up alive three days later. What's up with that? Now, it says in Jonah 1, this is King James, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, well that doesn't sound like forever. That sounds like three days and three nights. Okay, 72 hours, something like that. In verse, chapter two, verse six, 
I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars, sounds like a prison, right? Was about me forever. And yet, uh, hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God? Doesn't sound like forever, does it? What's up with that? In Chronicles, we see an apparent contradiction. Jehovah dwells in Solomon's temple forever, but we know that the temple was sacked and destroyed. Does Jehovah dwell there today? <clears throat> I could read these to you. I'll just take. I'll just pick one. Right. Uh, Second Chronicles seven sixteen. You want to take a look at that? And this is, I believe, Solomon talking. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. Well, this is actually Jehovah talking to Solomon, right? For now I have chosen and sanctified this house. It's where the Lord's house is. It's the temple in Jerusalem. That my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Who's, who's been to Jerusalem? Show of hands. Anyone been to the Holy Land? Is the temple still there? No. Nope. There's a wall, right? There's like the basement wall or whatever on one side that's still there, the wailing wall as they call it. So the punchline, we must exercise caution in translating olam, everlasting or perpetual. That doesn't mean it can't mean that. You just gotta be careful. Well, so what does olam mean? If we go to our lexicons, we get some interesting feedback. In uh, the Dunesi, uh, Jensenius Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon, the definition of olam is that which is hidden, especially hidden time. In Strong's Concordance, we have the Hebrew word 57 and 69. I keep those in there. This allows you to study. 57 and 59 is the unique identifier for the word olam. Derivation from the Hebrew word alam, 59 56. It means properly concealed among other things, a vanishing point. There's some interesting themes here. I'm gonna show you a verse in just a moment. One that I discovered when I was looking through every occurrence of Olam and Alam. Themes of a vanishing port, point, like a seemingly unending horizon. How many of you traveled in the western part of the United States? Okay, a lot of you. You come to these vistas in places like Utah or New Mexico, and you can see, you know, there's, there's no forest, right? You can see the mountains way over off in the distance. You can see them way off in the distance. You're on a highway and you're traveling, let's say east or west, doesn't matter which way. You can see the road ends on the horizon. Does it really end there? No, right? It, you know, it keeps going and it goes to Phoenix or wherever your destination is. It goes to Salt Lake City, goes to, call, you know, Denver. The road doesn't end there. It just appears to end there, has a vanishing point. There's an equivalent, right? Now put yourself back in that Hebrew mode, pre-advent. The course of a caravan, a caravan route, going through the desert, trading spices perhaps, you know, with the Queen of Sheba, right? Down in the south someplace. It's like a, a, a route of a road, very similar, right? You've got a purpose in mind, there's a vanishing point. You can't see everything, right? But you know that we've taken this road before. If we go west, go to that mountain range, and then turn right, we'll get to our destination. It's another theme, flow, such as a river. You're going to see this in just a minute. And that one, I'm sure, probably is common, common thought that many of you can relate to. Something hidden, as in an undercurrent. So these are subtleties. Um, let me show you an example of where those subtleties um, are exhibited. Job. Does anybody want to take a guess? I mean, we had, uh, there, there were some books right in the back that we're talking about. The books of the Bible, when were they written? Who wrote them? Approximately when? What was the purpose? When was the book of Job written? Anybody know who wrote it? Did Job write it? It's a pretty old book. Uh, I don't mean to speculate. Um, I don't think we know exactly. But Job was probably a contemporary, uh, it could have been a contemporary of Abraham for all we know. It's a pretty old book. This is an NIV version of Job. 
chapter 6, 15 through 19. Feel free to turn to this and look at it. I've looked at a whole bunch of different uh, versions of this and looked at it in the, in, in the Hebrew. This one is probably the closest that I found to a, a reasonably good translation. A despairing man, this is Job speaking, a despairing man should have the devotion of his friends, even though he forsakes respect of the Almighty. Okay, that's Job being sarcastic, right, with his friends. He says, because uh, Job has just been hit with a big calamity, right? His friends are saying, you know, everything was great. Now everything's gone to pieces. Job says, but my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams. They're called wadis in the, in the, mid, in the Middle East. As, as undependable as streams that overflow when darkened by thawing ice, swollen with melting snow. Well, that's literally says in the Hebrew, where the snow is hidden. When it melts, it becomes part of the river, right? It becomes part of the, we call them in Southern California, Rusty knows this, we call them arroyos. It's the Spanish term. It's a canyon. Any place there's a canyon and the water will collect and it rains in Southern California, when it, when it rains, it usually rains hard. <laughs> you, get, you get a flash flood down this corridor, you know, of, a, of an arroyo. And they called it the Wadi in the Middle East. But they cease to flow in the dry season and in the heat, banished from their channels. Caravans turn aside from their routes. There's that theme again. They go up into the wasteland and they perish. The caravans of Tema look for water. The traveling merchants of Sheba look in hope. Well, in the summer, good luck. You're not likely to find any water. Let's look at the first three occurrences of Olam. This is a technique Otis used to use. He used it for, for instance, uh, when you examine the word nefesh, soul. Look at the first three or four occurrences. It tells you a lot. Here's the first one. <clears throat> it's in Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Now, let us put forth his, lest he, lest he put forth his hand, take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. This is where Jehovah kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, right? Here it is in Hebrew. Well, here's the first word you already know in Hebrew. Hebrew. Yehovah. Elohim. Lord God. Amar hen Adam. Adam. That's Adam's name. Adam's name means man. That's what it means. Eshed yada. Yada. Yada, yada, yada. It's the same word. You guys have all heard that, right? Yada, yada, yada. It's Hebrew for I know, I know, I know. It's what someone says when they don't want to listen to you. Ah, yada, yada, yada. Tabra shalak yad lakwa etz sheakal chayyai olam. This word is the word for life or live. Chayim is the is the noun verb, a form of it. That's the verb. Olam, last word in this phrase. Olam appears to modify the verb just before it. Chaya. So what does that mean? Well, that means it's being used as an adverb, right? More or less. All right. Genesis 6.3, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. When I was young, I read this verse, and that verse doesn't completely make sense to me. Why would God say, say for that he is also flesh? Well, God knows what humans are, what their constitution is. That would be like me saying, Hi, Steve, you're Steve. Or, Hi, Jane, you're Jane. That just seems odd to me. And I, I always question those things. Why did, he, why did he say that? Well, here it is in the Hebrew. Yehovah Amar Ruach. Ruach means, uh, that's the word for heaven. Spirit, I'm sorry, it's a word for spirit. Uh, spirit is a translation, by the way. The word in the native Hebrew means wind, wind or breath. Spirit is a translation of it. So, let's go back. Yehovah Amar Ruach Olam, Din Adam, there's that word Adam again, Gambasar Shagag Yam Ma'ach Esrim Shane. 
There's another word you probably know. Yom. Yom Kippur. Andy, you brought that up the other day. Yom Kippur. You guys have heard of Yom Kippur? It's a Hebrew day of atonement. Yom is the word for day. Okay? Well, now, how many words are we up to? Five or six? So it appears that Olam is paired with the noun spirit, but it's modifying the verb strive. Okay. Looks like another adverb. Genesis 6 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old and renowned. Okay. Well, here's a resultant version. If you look at the Hebrew, that's the word for Nephilim, right? It's the, uh, the giants, right? Nephil Aretz Yan, is that word Yan again? Acharken Ashar Ben, Ben, Ben. My middle name is Benjamin. Another nice Hebrew name. What does Ben mean? Ben means literally son. Do you know what Benjamin means? Son of the left hand. It's kind of like a Hebrewism for my right hand man. It's kind of what it means. Elohim Baobath, Adam, Yalad, Hemgebur, Olam Enosh, Shem. Okay, I've translated it. It's the end of the verse that I thought was a little bit, you know, wonky here, and I tried to fix this. And you have to supply the ellipsis to make sure that that phrase gets repeated properly. And I, I've rendered it, they, the mighty ones of the Nephilim, outflow. The Nephilim outflow, that's what it means. Renowned men. So in the King James, it really hasn't been translated, right? So I've tried to put that in a form. It makes a little more sense. <clears throat> what Genesis, the author of Genesis is referring to here, right? This was an outflow, and it was a race of people, right? It's where the term uh, Adam comes in. It's interesting how Adam and Inish, Inish, which is another word for mankind, how those words get interplayed in Hebrew. That's not our, our focus of this particular um, study. Um, but it's interesting to note, right? Nephilim is basically being used as a different, it's a, it's a hybrid race, right? So it's being kind of used that way. All right, Olam is flexing. It's a very flexible word. It's flexing here in Hebrew. So what have we learned so far? Well, a couple of observations, right? Ancient Hebrew is a language deficient in adjectives and adverbs. So what happens in Hebrew is they use nouns and employ them in the language. I'll show you a couple constructs here just to give you a sense of how that works. So olam, we've seen it being used as an adverb. Looks like it gets used in an adjective in a number of places, but we know it's a masculine noun, so it probably gets used as a noun too. I haven't seen those in the first three occurrences. But as we progress with this study, olam is a noun. I've come up with four, play, four different kind of versions of that theme. Um, nouns in a construct straight state, I'm going to show you that in a second. The conjunctive noun, Ginny brought this up, it's the use of the word odd, autolam. It's a com, it's a conjugate, a conjunctive, right? A poetic case, I'm going to show you a poetic case, because if you don't have, in, you know, the, the opportunity to make use of the interchange of Greek and Hebrew, then the question becomes, can you find something in Hebrew that has a repetition that allows you to establish a relationship? Lastly, the proper noun. That is our horizon. That is the horizon for this particular study. The proper noun. Nouns in a construct state. I'm not going to attempt to teach you how to write this, but you can see the, the uh, phonetic versions right here next to it, right? So this is how Hebrew expresses a possessive, right? We have simple constructs in English, right? And here's five examples. Voice of man, king of the land, servant of the king, word of the prophet, book of the law. You could use the possessive case in English and say man's voice, the land's king, the king's servant, etc. right? Possessive case, that's how we do it in, uh, in English. This is how you do it in Hebrew. You have the construct noun and then the absolute noun. And that's the way 
you normally would translate. Those two things are linked. And in Hebrew, you simply have to do a lot of inspection to make sure that you understand which nouns are being linked. Conjunctive case, it's kind of an interesting variation on a theme. Let's look at a particular set of usage here. Jehovah speaking to Abraham, right, on the occasion of his second visit to the land of Canaan. He says in Genesis 3.15, For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, Olam. Eretz, Ra'ah, Nathan. There's Nathan's name, by the way. That's not a, that's not a typo. Eretz, Ra'ah, Nathan, Zerah, Ad Olam. This word Eretz, you'll see that in Hebrew all the time. That's the word for land. Like the land of Canaan, the promised land. It can be used just for ground, right? The, the ground that you stand on. So now we're up to what? Seven or eight words in Hebrew? This is the, uh, my resultant version, the countryside or the territory that you are seeing. Jehovah says, I will grant that to your descendants, even with respect to the Olam. Ad is a conjunctive, it's a preposition. Um, in this particular case here, it's uh, Strong's word 5704. It means toward. So it's, it's pointing to something. Toward, until, it's a, it's a preposition. A couple other ways you could translate it. But in this particular occurrence in, in 1315, it's interesting to note that Ad also has a noun form which is Strong's word in Hebrew 5703. The noun form of ad means properly a preemptory terminus. So by implication, duration. When you have a terminus, right, the thing ends. We know that if we drive across that desert we were describing earlier in Arizona and we continue to drive west, you will eventually reach the Pacific Ocean, right? And that's a terminus because you can't keep driving into the ocean. You could, I guess, get on a plane or a boat and continue from there. But you've re you reached a terminus. And that is a way that this conjunctive can be used uh, in the sense of advance or per per perpetuity, right? Because it, it, it comes, what comes with it is maybe your journey ends there in Los Angeles. Maybe it doesn't, right? Maybe it continues on because you're going to catch a plane from there. Okay, a poetic case. So this was what I referred to earlier. Can we identify a quote in, in Hebrew where words are being interplayed or interchanged and you can look at the contrast and say to yourself, okay, this phrase is referring to the next phrase. And here's a good example. It's in Habakkuk 3, 1 through 6. Chapter 3, 1 through 6. Now who's the actor here? In, in this particular portion of scripture, God, the Holy One. It, it really is pointing to Messiah, I'm, I'm convinced. In verse 3 of that particular section, it says, He stood, he measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. This is King James. In Hebrew, I've kind of organized, it's poetry. This is Hebrew poetry. So I've organized it that way. Amad mod Eretz, there's that word land again. Ra'ah nathar goi, goi. Anybody recognize goi? Goi is the Hebrew word for the nations. Okay, now your vocabulary is up to nine words or something. Ad, is that word ad? Ad harar putz, olam gibach, shachach, halika olam. Ad olam olam. Now, what's interesting about that construct, right, in that portion there that's in the slightly orange color, right? We've got figurative language here. We know from our earlier studies, right, that the term mountains here is being used figuratively, it's being used of governments. Hills are lesser governments. There's an interchange here in the third and the fourth phrase. Olam and Ad are being used 
inter interchangeably. They're being used in the same fashion, right? So that's interesting. These two words are basically being placed in poetic terms and being used one kind of one for the other. And remember that term caravans of Sheba that we saw from Job? That's the same word. Halika. Caravan. It's interesting. King James doesn't even get close to that. This is his ways are everlasting doesn't say anything about caravans but we would note you've got two nouns in that construct state the one that we showed you earlier with a little chain in it right the last poetic phrase could be better rendered an ever-flowing procession that's what a caravan is right it's a procession in this case a procession of animals uh, with their goods and their keepers and all that kind of stuff so I've color-coded that, hopefully you can follow it. Very simple example, but an interesting interchange in Hebrew. Hopefully I haven't lost anybody yet, right? You guys are all still on board? All right, we're getting to our punchline. This is our kind of our punchline, right? Hebrew has no punctuations like English does. You can't put capital letters and you can't put exclamations and we do all sorts of things in English to make, to make ourselves, try to make ourselves clear, right? Here's a proper noun, what I believe to be a proper noun usage of the term Olan. And it appears in Isaiah. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar with this one, right? This is part of Handel's Messiah, right? Yaled Yalad Ben Nathan Misra Shekem Shemkar Ach Pelayetz Gibor El Ad Absar Shalom. Shalom. Who knows what Shalom means? Peace. All right, now you're up to 10 words. I wasn't kidding you guys. It's not as hard as you think. It takes a little work. Not as hard as you think. That word odd in that particular verse is the noun form. Okay, called it out there for reference. Here's a resultant version. I tried to make this make as much sense as I can make with the Hebrew because it's an interesting progression of just a bunch of nouns stuck together. A male child is born, a son is given. He will shoulder, that is, stabilize the government. The governmental order is what it actually says, the governmental order. His name shall be proclaimed, marvelous one, counseling one, mighty God, perpetual father, prince of peace. Each of those is really, you know, a proper noun when you think about it. It's a term, it's a term for Messiah. Verse seven, in Hebrew, Merbe Misra Shalom Ketzkese David. That's how you pronounce it in Hebrew, David. Mamlaka, that's a form of the word for government. This comes from the word king. Kan Kaad Mishpat Sedaka Adolam Kin A Yehova Saba Asa. We're getting a lot of repetition here, aren't we? We're getting to see. Getting to see odd again, you're getting to see the word for David, Yehovah is in there. So you already know the vocabulary for half the words in this verse. Odd is being used as a noun here again, okay? I've provided a, a resultant version. Of the growing increase of his governmental order and of peace, there will be no end in sight. From David's throne throughout his dominion, Establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness with respect to the Olam. Adolam. The passion of Jehovah and his hosts will accomplish this. Not the church, not you, not, not you or me, not mankind. The passion of Jehovah. Jehovah is his fervor. It's his plan. All right, so I've kind of given you this punchline, right? It, it appears that the Holy Spirit is using the term olam as a proper noun. Let's look at examples of that. We detect this in Daniel 9, uh, Daniel 9, correct. Daniel 9, 24. Take a look at that if you want, but here's the King James. You guys are familiar with this. This is Daniel 70 weeks, right? 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins 
to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right, in Hebrew it says, Shibi Aim Shabua Chathak Akodesh Kodesh. Kodesh is the word for holy. Kodesh. Simple word. Now you're up to 11. Kodesh. Irkala Pasha Timam Chatha Chatha Akafar. Kafar. It's actually a form of the word for atonement. Atonement is one of those, I get off on tangents sometimes. Atonement is one of those holy words that nobody. I think in the Christian world, you know, we kind of gloss over it. Atonement. Yes, you've been atoned. What does atonement mean? It literally means a covering. A covering over. Covering over. The blood of Christ is an atonement. It covers over your sins and my sins. And God does not see them anymore. Okay? That's what the word means. All right. Avan bao olam tzedek. Chatam Chazam Nabi Mashak. That's the Hebrew word for Mashiach. Mashiach is how you say it. It means Messiah. Now you're up to 12 words. Right? Mashiach. Kodesh Kodesh. Holy, holy. Kodesh Kodesh. Hebrew does this a lot. We're going to see another example in a minute. It just slaps nouns together. In English, we try to make more sense when we write stuff. We have more ways of making sense and expressing ourselves. They just said, Kodesh, Kodesh. If I talked to you and said, holy, holy, you'd be looking around going, okay, where's the noun for that? What's Mark talking about? You know, what does it point to? What's he talking about? All right, here's a result in version. A period of 77 years, 70 times seven is really what it says, 77 of years, 490, are marked out for my people. That's Israel. It's interesting in scripture, Goy, which is the nations, Am I, or Am, which is people, my people. It's always my people. It's always Israel. It's always what it refers to. I've never, I have not found a case yet where it does not, does not mean that. My people, my holy city, which is Jerusalem, and to restrain their rebellion against God, to put an end to their sin, that was Israel's great sin of idolatry. That's the, you look at like the Ten Commandments, it's the first thing. You shall have no other gods before me. And what did the Hebrews do? They ran after um, phallic symbols, brazen calves. I'm, take your pick. All sorts of interesting, weird things that people around them in Canaan, right, and Egypt and places like that had, had developed. Those are the objects of man, not, not the objects of God. To completely cover their iniquity, that's that word for atonement. And to, uh, let's see, and to cause to ensue the righteousness olam. That's my rendering. To seal up, meaning to certify the vision and the prophet. And to anoint, it's the word, word Mashiach, right? The word for Messiah means technically the, the anointed. It means to anoint or the anointed one. And here it's being used as a verb. To anoint the Kodesh Kodesh. Holy of holies. Okay, So that's also kind of a proper noun when you consider that. So I've rendered at least two proper constructs here, right? The righteousness, Olam, and the holy of holies. So that, that's kind of what I'm saying. It would appear from the context, right? It would be a great disservice if we tried to translate the word olam in this verse by the English word perpetual. That would be an error. It's just an error based on the context and the way that the, the words have been organized and the expression and what it's trying to communicate. Now, since olam, the masculine noun, is being used in the construct state here uh, with the Hebrew word for righteousness, which is tzadek, that's a simple one, too. You see that over and over again. God is righteous. Sadek. That's now your 13th Hebrew word. Okay? It's a masculine noun, and the language uses that construct thing, right? With the, with the link again, right? With the chain link. It employs one noun to refine the other. We could translate this either the olam, which is characterized by righteousness, or by putting the effective adjective first, like we do in English frequency. You know, we, we would render it 
the righteousness olam. And if we infer from this that it's referring to the olam to come, the kingdom olam, the government of God, then it becomes a reference to a proper, essentially a proper noun, if we were to express it, you know, in English. That's the unique character of that period of time, which is the subject of this conference, right? The unique outflows of God. If we look at that aspect of the word olam, the unique outflow of God, one that this world has never seen before, never been equaled. It's the righteousness olam in Daniel 9.24. So if there's any doubt concerning the recognition of olam as a proper noun that it can be used that way, I would say that all doubt can be removed if we look at a few other prophetic passages, some of which have what is, can only be referred to as a double noun construct. It's that emphasis thing, right? Tzedek, tzedek, holy of holies. That's an emphasis. There are holy places in the temple. You had a holy place, and then you had a holy of holies inside that, right? So. It's an elevation, right, in terms of uh, a linguistic construct, construct referring to that. Hopefully I haven't lost anybody. <clears throat> We're getting to our punchline here. Double noun construct. We're going to look at two of them. Psalm 92 and uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 18. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forward or ever, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I read this one when I was younger too and said, eh, the English doesn't completely make sense to me. Of course, there's figurative things going on here, right? And if you don't understand that, it just sounds, yeah, highly, highly poetic. In Hebrew, Har Yalad Chul Eretz Tabel, Olam Adalam El. Here's a resultant version for you to ponder. Since the mountains were brought forth and you shaped the earth, the inhabitable world, you are God over it with respect to the olam of the olam. Let's look at another. Daniel 7, chapter 7, verse 18. In the King James it says, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, possess the kingdom, forever, even forever and ever, and ever and ever and ever and ever, and ever amen. <laughs> uh, it looks even even more peculiar when you look at the, the um, original Hebrew. I'm sorry, this is actually Aramaic. Daniel, the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Um, what's the relationship of Aramaic? As you recall, the Hebrews were now, uh, they had been taken to Babylon, right? They were now part of Babylonia. Daniel is under Nebuchadnezzar. Aramaic is the uh, form of Hebrew. It's a derivative of Hebrew, but it's the language. It's kind of like a relationship between, let's say, Latin and modern Italian, right? So Aramaic was the language that Jesus spoke when he was alive in Palestine and uh, on the earth for 33 years. I provided um, a couple things here. We have the Strong's word 5956. Alam, close relative, right? As we learned early on to Olam. Okay, it's a close relative. It's, it's the Aramaic equivalent of Olam. And this is the resultant version that I've come up with. The holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, that is the monarchy of the government, and they shall possess the kingdom with respect to the Olam, even the Olam of the Olam. In Hebrew that reads... Kadish, Alyon, Kabal Malku, is that word for king again? Kingdom, Malku. Shakan Malku, Alam, 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 Alam. We don't do that in English. People will look at us really funny. You know? But there it is in Hebrew. A final example from Ezekiel, chapter 37, 25. Ezekiel, a prophet. He's in Assyrian captivity, right? And Ezekiel writes, And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they will dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. 
of course, you're all suspecting there's got to be a lot of olams in this, right? In Hebrew, Yeshabaretz Nathan Yakab Abed Ab Yeshab Yeshab Ben 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 Olam Abed David Nasi Oad Olam. There's that word Ben again. Hebrew word for son. Ben Ben Ben. We don't talk that way, right? In, in, in English, you've got to add some things. You've got to add some prepositions or something. Maybe some articles just to make sense out of it, right? Here's a resulted version to consider. They shall inhabit the land given to my circuit, Jacob. So, Yaqab. That's the uh, proper name for Jacob. That's how they spell it in, in phoneticized Hebrew. They shall inherit, and let's start over. They shall inhabit the land given to my son, Jacob, where their fathers dwelled, dwelling with their children, literally sons, right? That's what it says, Ben. And their children's children, literally their sons' sons, in perpetuity. That's how I rendered it. David, my servant, will be their ruler with respect to the Olam. With respect to the Olam. We're talking about the future, right? This prophecy is still future. So what does Olam of Olam mean? Well, the phrase Olam of the Olam means the preeminent Olam. So it's very similar linguistically in Hebrew to King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Um, that's used to call attention to a preeminent monarch. Sometimes used as a title for Jehovah, but it's not limited to that, right? We saw yesterday, um, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 237, he's called a King of Kings. He had a bunch of kings underneath him. We'd call them maybe governors or something, but he was a King of Kings. <coughs> So the Olam of the Olam means a preeminent Olam, preeminent outflow, preeminent outflow from God. We also saw, remember, Kodesh Kodesh, Holy of Holies, calls attention to the preeminent holy place in the temple. That's what this term is getting to, it's what this term means. It, what it, we've got to infer from this, but this is where the body of knowledge, understanding, maybe that's a better term, this is where the body of understanding, you know, kind of lies. Let's return to that peculiar passage where we started. Journeys, that's why I said this is a journey. We kind of come full circle, right? Here's a resultant version of Ecclesiastes 3.11. <clears throat> he has made beautiful things in their season. He has placed the olam in their heart, such that mankind cannot trace out the work products that Jehovah has produced from beginning to end. I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. It's a tough study. Hebrew is not an easy language, but now you all have at least 13 or 14 words in Hebrew. And if you do as I do and use the Blue Letter Bible frequently and the concordance is associated with it, the uh, phonetic Hebrew, which is easy for us to produce, it relatively easy for English speakers to, to pronounce and understand and recognize. You'll see words over and over, repeated over and over. Oh, I know that word, aretz, that means land. Kodesh, oh, that's holy. It's like learning any foreign language, but at that level, I think it's not that hard. It's, it's work, but the tools exist. Having the right tools, my grandfather used to say, he used to love to work on automobiles. He says, you know, you gotta have the right tool. <laughs> if you don't have the right tool, it's hard. Right? Just to replace the spark plug. But if you have the right tool, it's not that hard. A little bit of work. You, maybe you want to put some gloves on, you can get your hands dirty. But I encourage you all, you get your hands dirty, it's okay. Right? You can wash your hands. You can wash your hands. All right, well, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope you all got something out of this.